Okay, yes. uh, I'm trying to be in the spirit of the Pride Month, so you could see my yeah, um, the coloring in information disorder. <laughs> Just to celebrate in the spirit of the month. Anyway, um, I think we will start with the phenomenon first. You know, a concept and phenomenon that that I I would um, explain under the big umbrella of information disorder, and then uh, I will I will paved my way into this research that I've done. Um, actually, I completed this, the research last year, but we started around the time of the general election in 2019. So, um, I mean, still quite recent, you know, and a lot of things that could be generalized from the findings, I think still ring true until today. But anyway, uh, let us start with um, a bit of um, concepts and, and, and phenomena. Much of what we talked about uh, under this big umbrella of information disorder, sort of came to light uh, around uh, the mid-2010 and, and more specifically um, during and after 2016 general, uh, oh, no, general election, uh, presidential election in, in uh, the United States. And um, words and terms that we know as fake news or post-truth tend to surface and become popularly um, known after the 2016 um, presidential election. As evidence in this statistics that um, you know, uh, adults in the US um, tend to find that um, they're confused by things that they're exposed to online. And even some 23% said they have shared fabricated political stories themselves. You know, sometimes they know it, sometimes they don't. So um, is, it, is it the intention that's the matter here or it, or it doesn't matter because it's already out there. Once you share, things get you know, circulated in the system. Anyway, um, also one year after the election was completed, there was a study which Turn, which, which confirmed that um, a lot of the messages that circulated during the election were actually identified as, you know, unverified WikiLeaks or sometimes uh, Russian originated news stories, which in other words are like propaganda. And a more recent MIT study, I think this one came out in 2019, uh, they studied Twitter and they found that lies are more, more likely to be retweeted, 70% more likely uh, than facts. And uh, a similar study in, in, at USC also found that um, um, Twitter users are actually bots. You know, things that we see circulated on Twitter are actually automated messages produced by social bots. You know, and of course, everybody heard about the Cambridge Analytica and the um, Facebook leak of personal information and how this was manipulated um, um, to affect important processes like Brexit and so on and so forth. Of course, um, the beginning, not the beginning, but the, the, the time when you know, things tend to surface and, and this phenomenon have become globally recognized as uh, a threat to the to, 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 to the globalized citizen of the world. Fake news. But um, as far as the term, using of the term is concerned, you know, we, we hear a lot of fake news and fake news tend to be an American term. Now, when we talk about fake news, we hear a lot of that uh, from, from the US side of story. But when we go to um, Europe, they tend not to use fake news as the term to describe this ongoing phenomenon because they feel that when you talk about news, news have to be based on facts. And if you know it's fake, it's fabricated, if it's misled, if it's distorted, then it doesn't deserve to be called news. 
So the European Union um, has has um, appointed a high level expert group in 2018 to study what they call disinformation because they feel that this is not fake news, but the phenomenon is more general, is more general, is more uh, all encompassing than just news because a lot of time it doesn't appear as in, in news form. Sometimes it's just like conversational. Sometimes it's memes. Sometimes it's infographics. You know, not necessarily news. So um, this information seems to be a more applicable word to describe the phenomenon. But anyway, um, even this information doesn't quite capture it all. So they come up this high-level expert group that was appointed by the EU um, came up with a new umbrella term which they call information disorder, okay. And this is the scheme, the scheme of things. Under information disorder, uh, three different types of um, information problematic, as I would like to call it, because these are all problematics. Um, three types of information dis uh, problematics are included under this big umbrella of information disorder, from misinformation to disinformation and malinformation. And this schema is quite um, illustrative, actually. I think it's really helpful in, in understanding because um, when they talk about misinformation, it means that you know they are, these are unintentional mistakes. It's like misunderstood or uh, misinterpreted or something, or uh, so when misinformation is produced or shared, usually it's without intent. People don't really know that it's false. Of course, it does falseness. It's not true. The things that are being shared may be distorted or false, but the person who uh, shared it or distributed it didn't know and didn't have the intent to um, spread fake or false information. But the impact's the same because you know it's already out there, like I said. But as far as disinformation is concerned, disinformation is in the middle. So it contains the elements of falseness, falseness, as well as the intent to harm. So for disinformation, um, people who created disinformation, of course, has the intent from the very beginning to cause some kind of um, impact, negative ones. Okay, like created conspiracy theories, um, spreading rumors that are um, damaging to a person, organization, a nation, whatever. And usually it's distorted, fabricated, even fabricated information that's already, that, that are created and then disseminated online mostly. So this is disinformation. This information mostly uh, would be intended to affect public opinion of some kind. If it's just gossip and rumors, we don't really call it disinformation because it doesn't really direct or affect public opinion in one way or another. And then you have malinformation. Malinformation is quite interesting because a lot of time malinformation may not be false. It may be good, it may be true, or it may be based on true stories. But usually malinformation is something that something that's private, something that's damaging, something that could be scandalous. But then the intent to harm is very strong. And even if what you said is true, but maybe it shouldn't be publicized. Maybe it shouldn't be out there for people to interpret it, you know, in one way or another, because, you know, it's really going to create social divide or um, really affecting people, uh, a person reputation. But anyway, so we have these three categories of um, information problematic under information disorder. Okay, this is to recap again. Okay, uh, when, I, when I said fake news, so it's yellow journalism, any kind of propaganda um, that come in the form of news. And a lot of times it's uh, circulated in online media and sometimes you know it's picked up by, by mainstream media. Then you have misinformation, uh, false, inaccurate, but the person who spread it didn't know it was untrue. And then you have disinformation, of course, false, plus the intent to cause harm. Okay, and usually with the intent to affect public opinion and obscure the truth. And then you have malinformation, 
which is private, usually private information, damaging information, and hate speeches are included under malinformation. Okay, and ultimately, this information disorder contribute to the condition which we call post-truth because people don't really know what to believe in anymore. You know, they lost faith. They become disillusioned in all this um, dissemination of information in the online sphere or the volume, um, the falsity of it. So um, they don't really care. You know, part of it, you know, spur them into thinking that what's the point? You know, if I believe this benefits me or uh, I believe that, you know, somebody is wrong, somebody is um, corrupt, it doesn't matter what facts are being presented to me, you know, because I'm going to believe it anyway. Or on the opposite side, um, you don't care to verify things that are being circulated and shared to you because, you know, your belief is what prevails. You know, it's not truth anymore. So that's that's what we talk about when we, when we mean post-truth situation. Anyway, so that's the that's the story. And I, I guess m most of you already know, but I'm just trying to recap in a frame that uh, that's uh, more systematic anyway. But when we talk about disinformation, I mean, although this word is um, quite popularly used now, especially in, in, in Europe and in scholarly works, that deals with information disorder. Um, the word, as the Russians call it, you know, has has a has a long legacy. And um, although, when we look back into the time of the Cold War, um, Russia has already been known, you know, for the legacy in creating disinformation. But um, in the digital age, I think their capacity in doing so has multiplied and has been improved tremendously as well. Okay, because um, a lot of the, um, um, what we call, we call in Thailand, we call information operation or IO. You know, the Russian IO um, has been noted in a lot of um, international events, including the um, Russia, Russia Georgia, Georgia war, the climate crisis, and also the downing of Malaysia Airlines Flight 17. Okay, this is just a, a comparison from past to present. In 1985, this news was um, noted to have originated from uh, Russian propaganda in the Cold War. And in 2016, this very news that have spurred a lot of um, fundamental conservatives in uh, Catholics, especially in, in the US to vote for Donald Trump, Okay, this news was also um, has has been um, noted to have been produced by uh, by um, Russian IO. Okay. Anyway, um, this apart from um, this information, malinformation and misinformation that we talked about, um, there have also been been um, attempts to classify fake news. Okay, so I, I think it's, I mean, the, the reason why I'm, I'm going through these classifications and all these hypernames is because I think it's useful, you know, when you start um, studying phenomenon really in relation to this um, information problematics, you know, just to know what kinds of classifications, you know, have been created in order to analyze them. So these are uh, uh, analysis of fake news that have been quite established and have been uh, often cited in literature. Okay, so you have satire, but when satire is taken as 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 true, you know, as 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 facts, not as true as far as facts, you know, and sometimes there's false connection, misleading content, false context, imposter content, manipulated content, and um, usually with doctor doctor image and fabricated content. So this fabricated content is 100%. Everything is uh, created. No, nothing is true. Okay, and as far as elements of information disorder are concerned, um, this is like a procedure of things. You know, in, in the past, you hear a lot about SMCR, you know, send a message, um, channel receiver, that kind of thing. And that's the procedure of um, communication, which act actually was based on electronic communication, but then it was adopted 
to uh, human communication in the field of communication as uh, social science. But now that we have embarked upon information disorder, um, this um, procedure, you know, they said agent, message, interpreter, okay, it's still quite linear. You know, I'm not, I'm not so happy about this element, uh, elementary procedure of uh, considering information disorder because it's pretty much still uh, quite linear. But I mean, but when you look closely at, at you know, how, um, how agents is um, conceptualized, how message is conceptualized, how interpreter is conceptualized, and question to be asked for each element, you know, it's sort of um, give more light and more depth into analysis of, of each element. Because, you know, when you talk about agent, you know, it's not just the agent within the linear process of communication, you know, but you have to look at the agent, what type of agent, how organized are they, um, what is the motivation, um, what is their target audience, do they use automated technology? You know, these are important questions that have to be asked, you know, in considering, in analyzing, you know, process involved in information disorder. Uh, also, as far as the message, you have to clearly look into a, a, apart from the form of the message, you know, also the durability of the message, because when you look at online um, sphere, you know, durability is the key, because a, a lot of time um, things come and go, but uh, if it's durable, it tends to stay for a long time, then the, um, the harm or the impact will also stay for a long time too. And also interpreting, uh, actually this is based on um, on a more critical reading, uh, I think it's uh, they they use they refer to the um, um, theory of encoding and decoding by Stuart Hall, who is a prominent lecturer at the um, Birmingham School um, in in the UK UK because um, Stuart Hall has come up with this schema of encoding and decoding of media messages, and his major contribution. Uh, comes into decoding because uh, this, this is in contrast to the um, media effects model of communication in which you know the um, the receivers you know tend to be passively uh, consuming messages and and um, become like dopes um, that are uh, passive dopes that will be um, affected by all kinds of impacts and effects that the media, the dominant media are creating to them. But as far as uh, Stuart Hall is concerned, and he is giving an antidote to that with this decoding. Uh, he feels that you know all media messages are encoded with some kind of ideologies, but it doesn't mean that all the receivers, all the audience, you know, will be doped and will be duped into seeing things and believing uh, things in the direction that um, the center of the messages want because they have um, capacity, they have um, cultural capital as well to interpret things as they see, you know, fit into that situation. So there is this hegemonic reading, decoding, oppositional decoding, and negotiating decoding, meaning that there are layers and levels of um, opposition and negotiation that um, the audience could interpret uh, messages. So this is uh, actually adopted from, from um, Stuart Hall, I think. Anyway, and this is the phases of information disorder, the creation, the reproduction, and the distribution. So I mean, in understanding the schema of things, you know, will help you know, when, we, when we write uh, um, a research proposal to study this information or you know, um, information disorder of some kind um, to look at, you know, to, to, to conceptualize things in our conceptual framework. Okay, this is just to throw in a little more of the, of the uh, empirical, but also with uh, a research uh, undertone. Um, right in the same year that um, Trump was elected president, 2016, um, and uh, a close ally of the U.S. also got a new president, and that's the Philippines. 
And the Philippines has this guy, um, Rodrigo Duterte, who was who rose to victory, and also he was um, credited or discredited, as if you like, uh, for having uh, manipulated um, the information environment uh, surrounding the election. Okay, uh, a study has been launched and concluded that these are the agents we talk about just now. You know, the agents of disinformation. These are the main agents of network disinformation. Okay, so um, starting from you know, the chief architects and the digital influencers, the community level fake account operators to the grassroots intermediaries and then the public. Okay, uh, they're, not, they're not really looking at the process as much as the agents. You know, you could, you could see the process along the way of how um, disinformation um, were actually usually targeted against any enemies of Duterte, okay, discrediting them and promoting Duterte as um, a very powerful um, good news to the, the country and that kind of thing. But anyway, these are the agents along the processes of spreading and disseminating um, this information in support and in um, defense of the, of the key man, Duterte. Okay, apart from um, that schema that we talked about um, in terms of the elements, um, the, the, the faces, um, now a lot of literature on disinformation or, or information disorder also embarked upon counter disinformation. How do we solve problems like disinformation or information disorder? And this is most, um, this uh, this is this is a uh, a schema that that came up in um, in a joint report by the ITU and UNESCO, and they're talking about countering this information. And in 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 surveying around the world, you know, because this is a globalized experience. This is a globalized phenomenon, as I said earlier. Um, how many how how what types of responses are being given by different countries, different governments, different organizations around the world, or even individuals, you know, organized individuals against disinformation. And um, this report, which goes around the world, you know, uh, looking at uh, all these counter disinformation approaches, have grouped them into four types, you know, uh, identification responses and this is mainly known as the fact checking. So you have to identify what is what is fake news, what is disinformation, you know, to begin with. So the identification response um, is primarily uh, fact checking, um, and also there's response in at producer and distributors. So this could be legislative. This could be um, counter disinformation campaign. Okay, and sometimes um, in in situation or context like election or you know, uh, certain kind of um, rules and regulations are being introduced to target the producer and distributors of, of this information. In the meantime, there's also a response that targeted at the distribution mechanism, you know, and the algorithm, the intermediaries, and um, maybe just even to um, cut the, um, the support, the financial support to this um, distributors and creators of this information. And then there is um, response aimed at the, the target audience. Uh, so it runs from ethics and normative um, approaches to educational and empowerment. Okay, so these are the four types of disinformation. So if um, anybody is interested in, in studying uh, Countering disinformation. This would be a really okay. And um, actually, I, I just got this last night. Uh, we were working. I, I'm actually I'm working on a on a research project on actually I don't call it disinformation because um, there is some new word every day. And and the the latest um, word and term that is used to describe what's happening uh, right now in terms of uh, information problematic during pandemic is disinfodemic. So you have disinformation and epidemic. Okay, so the two words come 
combined into disinformation and epidemic. So we, we uh, my uh, RA, my research assistant, uh, assistant and I, uh, we are trying to do the literature review. And this, uh, um, as far as studies uh, is concerned that have been done on disinformation, um, these are uh, areas of study, uh, identification of it's disinformation uh, tar uh, or areas of study that aim at dissemination process. It is study that study the impacts of disinformation and media and information literacy. These are more empowering and, and uh, education response and also at the pro policy rep level and disciplinary would be at the um, legislative and monetization, demonetization. Okay, so, so this, uh, this are what we have concluded as far as um, um, countering disinformation, which will be applied to our disinfodemic uh, study, proposed study. Anyway, um, when we talk about disinformation, uh, malinformation or misinformation or information disorder, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, there is such a thing as an ecosystem in which you know this information phenomenon and problematic, if you like, uh, emerge and um, sustain themselves. Um, within this environment, there is another phenomenon, a closely related phenomenon that we feel has amplified or even intensified the effects of disinformation. Because if disinformation circulates within a relatively closed system, closed system doesn't mean like totalitarian system, you know, where um, Google cannot operate or, you know, we're not talking about China per se, but um, even in seemingly open um, environment of social media, there is such a mechanism that works to the contrary meaning you know we feel that you know we have access to ample resources of information but in actual fact you know we are being shaped our environment our user experience is being shaped by um, mechanism algorithmic mechanism within the system and um, and it contributes or give rise to what we call an echo chamber kind of environment and this is um, what I'm going to be sharing with you next, um, because echo chamber. I mean, we've done um, a study on echo chamber, um, like I said earlier in, in 2019, and and this is my um, original um, research contribution with uh, two other uh, researchers, um, Ajahn Pimon Pan at Chiang Mai University and Ajahn. Um, um, now I forgot his name. <laughs> okay, it's Am Pimon Pan Chayanan at Jing Mai University. And um, okay, his name will come back to me. He's my PhD student. He was my PhD student. Oh, not Jamie Rhodes, so Tessima, okay, at Bangkok University. So we, uh, the three of us teamed up and, and did this research that we, we're going to be uh, uh, showing to you. But before we go there, uh, this is where we, um, our point of departure, you know, why we were interested in studying um, echo chamber. We didn't study this information per se. We were studying the environment in which online political communication during uh, the 2019 general election took place. And we focus on a certain group of people that's the first time voters. But this is our point of departure. Um, we looked at a lot of um, incidents and also uh, scholarly articles and found that um, there seemed to be a consensus um, that in online environment, um, people tend to, even though you know we have open environment, but people tend to use, uh, to, to choose to be in cocoons, information cocoons, or echo chambers, if you like, you know, places where they feel comfortable um, to be conversing, to be exchanging, usually with like-minded individuals, with people who think alike, who 
who, who, who say things that are not dissonant with their ideas. So um, it, it creates um, threats, as we see it, to democracy. And because um, we could not really aim towards deliberative democracy, if people only listen and, and surround themselves with something that they feel comfortable, informatively, you know, and so well, this is what we call, not, not, not we call, but I mean, the um, scholars who wrote about it called echo chamber, because, you know, especially in polarized, especially in um, society that are driven apart by different ideologies, um, into different ideologic cam ideological camps, as you like. So, um, especially, and, and, and this happened um, every day, consistently in the online sphere. Okay. So this brings up, bring, bring us to this um, um, research, okay, uh, which I did, I, I said, with, with uh, two other researchers from Chiang Mai University and Bangkok University. So um, we would like, when we started, we would like to explore whether there is an echo chamber in, in online political communication. Because I mean, during that time, it was uh, the debates, you know, and, and the exchange politically was very intense. So it was really interesting. Okay, but before we went there, just a little bit on echo chamber. So um, I think I, I've talked about it before, but just to recap again, Echo chamber is a social phenomenon in which human users together with algorithmic computation in online system, filter content and user experience. So there are two things as we, as, as I frame it here, you know, the, this is from my own interpretation of the literature that are two things. One is the technological system, algorithm, AI, that study uh, user patterns and profiles and tendency and the other thing is the users themselves, it's their own choice. So these two things, these two elements come together and they filter out any kind of content that do not go along with, um, or that do not align with their thoughts and, or, or their beliefs. So this, what it results in is that, you know, the internet or, people's interactivity with the internet is just a big, um, is just a big um, enclave, if you like, enclave of, of like-minded people. Okay, so it also, and I, I think most of you might've been um, familiarized already with uh, Cass Sunstein, who was the first who came up with the idea of, uh, Echo Chamber, I think his first, first book came out in 2000, the year 2000, 1999, I'm not, so, not exactly sure, but the second version, republic.com 2.0, uh, published by Princeton University, uh, also talked about this in detail. Anyway, so um, the origin of Echo Chamber came from uh, first information overload, because when you are faced with too much information, the easiest thing is to just sift out, you know, what you feel most comfortable with. So politically, what you feel most comfortable with is what align with your beliefs and ideologies. Okay, the, the next thing is filter bubble. Okay, filter bubble is actually a term that was coined by this um, internet activist, Eli Pariser, he's also a techie. Uh, he, he wrote two books one in 2009 and the other one in 2012. In 2009, he uh, documented uh, um, what um, he researched about Google, the search engine. And in 2012, he researched about Facebook, but the results are pretty much the same in the fact that uh, both um, tech platform, these giant tech platforms uh, are using personal information and also use patterns of, of users to determine search results for Google and news feeds for Facebook. And they shape these um, 
search results and news feed in the direction that would be aligned, that would be reinforcing um, what the users are familiar familiar with or align with the ideas and, and, and um, thoughts. Okay, so what it does um, is that this filter bubble, which is a system, this is AI, we're talking algorithm. They, when it comes to things like politi politics, it tends to encourage partisanship and tribalism. Okay. Although, I mean, the origin is micro-marketing. Okay, but, but when it uses um, this um, aggregate surveillance in, through, through AI and, and computation, um, the result is um, echo uh, filter bubble. It's like you surround it, you filter out uh, things that are not aligned and you just let in things that are aligned and reinforcing your prior beliefs. Okay. So another thing that uh, contributes to echo chamber is cognitive dissonance. And so this is a psychological trait in, present in all human beings. And so when you have some discomfort with something that do not, that conflict with your beliefs and values, people tend to seek something that um, comforts them. Okay. And um, so with that, uh, with AI on what the one hand and with cognitive dissonance operating on the other, these two combine into um, major customization of your online environment in the direction that would make um, it a very comfortable cocoon for people to, to dwell in. Okay, so through features like unfriending, blocking, unfollowing or hiding, um, you're just singling out anything that's different from, from, from your thoughts and, and um, your values or whatever. So um, all the dissenting voices are, are silenced, you know, from your own uh, sphere of uh, social media use. Okay. So that's echo chamber. Uh, and the reason why we, we choose to study first-time voters, okay, as far as our research is concerned, is because um, it's very clear this group is still um, the strongest, the most prominent group of advocates for change in Thai society. In the past, you might have heard of uh, the red shirt or um, for after uh, before the red shirt, the yellow shirts, you know, although they are from opposing ideological camps. And then you, you like, uh, like it or not, you have the, um, um, now I forgot the name, but they were the, the main advocates for change in parenthesis um, seven years ago, and they gave a condition, precondition for the coup in 2014. Anyway, uh, up until now, uh, the other social groups and political factions have been weakened tremendously, and the youth groups, um, the newer generations, still stand to be you know, the, most, the most prominent. And, and still um, strong, quite strong in, in advocating for change and, and in terms of political activism. And also because um, based on our literature review, it's, it's found that early adulthood is the, is the time when um, people's political attitude and identity are um, mostly shaped and that tends to stay with you for the rest of your lives. Because if you're exposed to or you're forming some kind of political identity at this age, it tends to stick you know, for the rest of your lives. Anyway, so for first-time voters, you know, age between 18 and 24, uh, they within this group that, that's supported by research. So um, we see that uh, in their lives, um, in their political experience, um, they've gone through uh, a series of political conflicts, you know, mostly street protests in Thailand. And also a coup, and also a continuation of um, of power from the coup um, through a new political regime that came after the election in 2019. But anyway, um, based on the interviews that we have had with this group, their main message was that they had to come out and call out 
uh, for change because they have lived with something they have not chosen, they have not voted for for too long. Okay. Anyway, in, in sheer numbers, in terms of numbers, um, when we talk about first time voters, you should be, you know, those who are 18 or a few years older um, because, you know, general election usually takes place every four years. But in the Thai case, um, since we have been absent for from general election for some time because we had had a coup since 2014 and we had um, the general election in 2019. So actually five years, you know, of not having general election because we were under a coup, a military coup government. And also, if you count before that, uh, in 2014, there was a general election, you know, and, and people who were old enough to vote at, at that time went to the ballot and voted. But um, the votes didn't go very far because um, that election was nullified, you know, was nullified by, um, uh, I think it was the administrative court um, or not sure it's constitutional court, some court that it was unconstitutional. So that 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 um, general election was nullified. So basically we have first time voters who are, who didn't get to cast proper votes, you know, from 2014, plus the actual first time voters you know, in terms of their age in 2019. So this by calculation, um, total to 6.8 million people. And this account for 13% of all eligible vote voters in 2019. Or if you look in terms of number of MP seats in the house, that accounts for 86 out of 600 MP seats. And actually, uh, I didn't I didn't really, I mean, I stopped with my calculation there, but then I talked to um, a PhD student who is very political and he compared it to the number of, um, um, the, the number of um, MPs from this oppositional camp from the now defunct party, Pak um, Anakotmai, the Future Forward Party. You know, and and um, this was ac actually the, the number that, that gave boost to them, to the, to the house. So quite interesting. Anyway, also another story, an another um, reason why we chose to study first time voters is because they are digital natives. Okay, these people, uh, this group of people uh, were growing up digital. Okay, they have grown up digital and they're still growing digital. So uh, it's, um, it's quite uh, commonplace to be expecting that, you know, that political socialization would primarily take place online. That's my cat in the background. I locked the door and he wanted to get in. Anyway, so while, so, so online platform seems to be very dominant space for them. Uh, whereas um, traditional social institutions that may be um, influential in the past, like school, religion, mass media, may be receding in, in influence, okay. And also, um, and this is from another another um, um, aspect and another um, portion of the literature, uh, which look at youth and, and political participation. And um, one of the one of the advocates in 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 this um, literature uh, argue that um, actually when we think about youth as politically uh, apathetic and disinterested. Uh, it's actually um, not, it's actually ignoring the fact that um, maybe we are operating from, uh, from a traditional frame of reference because um, people who study youth tend to give um, importance to institutional politics, electoral politics, the big politics. But whereas uh, for these youngsters, maybe it's some kind of displacement you know, they're relocating their activities, their political interests, their political expression, and their uh, political participation into a different sphere and into a different form. Okay, so in this light, uh, online platforms, because, you know, it tend to be quite open and loose, 
and not so hierarchical, um, very informal. So maybe we are actually wit witnessing a kind of a displacement, a relocation, if you like, of um, political interaction, political participation. Okay, uh, this is in Thai, so I'm just gonna skip it. It's, um, we, we try to map um, all the major events uh, since, um, since 2015, um, yeah, 2015 until 2005, sorry, 2005 until um, last year to see how, because this is the, this is the, this is the timeline that that shapes or that surrounded um, political experience of, of this group of first time voters. Okay. Of course, we study online social media because um, not because, you know, because it's um, most used by this group of, of um, youngsters, but because, you know, because it is the um, platform where, where politics is, is taking shape, you know, and, and not, not just for the youth, but for other groups as well. Um, okay. And, and, um, We also feel that uh, uh, when we talk about democracy, you know, we, we have to to look at this platform, which is um, which is has become has become the the new social fabric of of, of politics. Okay. Okay, and these are some of the hashtags because Twitter is um, the space where most youngsters. Uh, engage in politics okay so when uh, they came they first came out last year um after the this first wave of covid pandemic sort of dissipated so they started coming out and their first um hashtag most popularized hashtag is that let it end with our generation and this was so powerful i mean i listened to the to the argument and, and this has hashtag is so meaningful. Let it end with our generation. What what ends? All injustice, all inequality, you know, all um, extra parliamentary intervention. You know, that's just the same kind of the argument. Anyway, and so these are some of the popular hashtags uh, during the election. So the bigger ones, sorry, I, I, I couldn't really um, translate everything into English in time, but um, for those of you who are Thai, um, you can see that with the bigger fonts mean um, this, is, this is more popularized than others. And for here, which is um, 2019 election, uh, Thailand election 2019, and this is Mai is um, Future Forward Party, you could see, you know, um, all the, 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 and, and here, Gong Le Tang means um, um, election rigged, you know, cheating in election. Okay, and this is more of the youth political movements in, in uh, 2020. Okay, anyway, as far as our objectives of research is concerned, uh, back to the echo chamber. You know, I, I tend to sideline a bit. So we want to see whether there is an echo chamber in online political communication during uh, 2019 general election, focusing on the first time voters, and then to analyze the relationship between echo chamber and political attitudes of the, uh, of the first time voters, and to see what are factors that influence the echo chamber phenomenon. Okay, um, now, I'm trying to highlight on the things that I've been assigned to talk about the methods. Okay, in studying this, you know, when we we first um, decided to study this um, this issue, it's quite hard because um, in social sciences, you know, you have methods like survey, with questionnaire based survey. You have focus group. You have um, um, interviews, that kind of thing. You know, but um, we want to do a multi methodology because we don't really want to rely on one. Usually we use three, you know, but for this, we use four. 
and each one is very distinct from each other. We have questionnaire survey. The questionnaire survey we achieved um, a total amount, a total number of um, three thousand respondents from around the country. And actually, we have we have had a um, very um, good contribution and cooperation with um, with universities um, around the country, with eight universities around the country and um, in four geographical regions. And so it, it was quite, it wasn't too difficult because you know we work in education, in higher education. So we have all these networks. But anyway, I mean, to, to be able to, our questionnaire is quite long and, and we explore all, this, um, all these elements uh, and um, look at correlation and relationships between different variables and all that. And to see whether or not <laughs> it's a four o'clock. I, I don't want to uh, interrupt, but you can continue actually. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll try. I, I'll, I'm almost done. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, we have the question and we have the focus groups. Okay, I mean, after the survey, we did focus groups with um, um, eight groups of people, eight groups of um, the same um, selected, you know, from the survey. And then we have um, engagement in Facebook page. And this is to determine whether there is, um, there is a um, filter bubble, okay? And then we have um, data analysis, social network analysis. And this is a big, uh, um, we use data mining and use big data analysis. And I couldn't do this alone. I had to uh, go and get help from uh, Wiseside, which is a social analytics company, social listening company. And we devised a multi-level of um, of search of of, of um, data analysis and and this we, I mean they run you know all the computations but before they have they could run the computation we have to recruit like ten different uh, coders to look into tweets because we only do doing Twitter and um, our hypothesis is to test whether a people who are from similar ideological uh, camps or ideological standpoints uh, tend to be attracted to each other and whether or not there is a connectivity of notes, you know, between the same attitude and whether or not there is a bridge in terms of opinion leader that influence um, both sides of polarized um, political opinions. Anyway, there is level that there are several layers of, of designs, but Suffice it to say, this is a, these are the dimensions that we, we study. The tweet, the retweet, the follow, the like, the reply, and the mention, and then we could actually um, get the samples. And within that samples, um, Wiseside um, wrote a program and look at, you know, the, look at the dimensions that we wanted to look at, the homophily, you know, how um, like-minded people tend to be attracted to each other. And, but we look at, these networks, you know, the networks of retweet, network of tweets, network of following, we find a mention. And what we found, let me just skip to the here. Okay, there is a, ma a major concentration of micro networks of like-minded people or homophily. Okay, so conservative tend to be uh, to, to be uh, attracted to each other, whereas liberal tend to be attracted to liberal. Okay. But before we could get there, I mean, this is a long story. I should I should have spent more time there. But um, we have to actually use coders, like I said, to look into tweets of this account to determine whether they are liberal or moderate or conservative. Okay, but and and we had to go through like a thousand uh, accounts to be able to label them before we actually could run the program and see how, you know, they, they are, at, whether or not they are attracted and they follow each other in, in different networks. Okay, this is the result from Twitter API analysis. Okay, the, the blue, it shows blue in my, on my screen is the liberal and the red or the orange are the conservative. Okay, so the, the bigger dots uh, the ones with more followers, okay? So the sort of the influencers. And we, we analyze whether there is a bridge, okay, that linked between the two camps, 
you know, the two, the two um, ideological um, um, use uh, the users with uh, two ideological camps, and there is a bridge, but the bridge was very small. We found very small number of bridges, um, and the, the bridges uh, turn out in terms of um, when we look at who are the bridges, and these are uh, Thai Rat, you know, the mainstream uh, Thai PBS. Sometimes there are um, politicians like Thanathorn or Biyabut, and also um, uh, John Wynne you know, opinion leaders and that kind of thing. So that's what we found. Anyway, I just like to end on the last note, the impact of echo chamber. Okay, um, from, uh, like I said, we did many um, methodologies and, and we talked to a lot of um, these youth as well, you know, 80 of them, you know, in a, in a focus group uh, interview. And Although it, it, they didn't say out loud, you know, it 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 could be deduced from the interview with them that you know, common experience is being depleted, you know, when because especially in in um, online sphere, you know, when they tend to be, I mean, because these kids, they said on a general note, they tend to follow a lot of a lot of um, a diverse uh, source of information, but. They also admit that once they're on Twitter, it's a different, it's a different sphere from general experience of, of uh, information environment. So um, that's kind of confirmed to us too that you know it's being depleted, common experience being depleted if you are only on a certain platform. Okay. And um, also, I mean, we might argue that actually this is a counter public sphere taking shape on Twitter. But I mean, to be a good public sphere, you know, I'm also I'm also using Habermasian um, uh, concept, which may not be um, consonant with what we are necessarily looking at here. But to apply Habermasian public sphere, um, a good public sphere has to be open. A good public sphere has to be connected to good to public policy. Okay, so if um, public sphere is not open, it tend to be closed and, and not open to different ideas. Um, it's not gonna work as a healthy and deliberative channel of communication. Okay, and also when echo chamber lead to extremism, you know, in Thai, we use a lot of words of tua long, tua long, but actually it's similar to like witch hunt or doxing, you know, getting, personal information out into public um, space, um, this will actually uh, debilitate free expression because a lot of people will just uh, spiral into silence because um, they fear, you know, they fear the threats of being hunted and, and being lynched online for that matter. Okay, so I'm gonna close here. So thank you very much. Thank you.